Uh, welcome to video number two of our Comenius Learning Series uh, for 2020 called A Wounded Faith, uh, Zinzendorf's Theology in the 21st Century. Uh, again, my name is Chaz, and I'm really excited to be here talking about our second, uh, our second video uh, in our series of six videos that will lead um, as part of our Zoom discussions for the Comenius Learning Series this year. Um, and so glad you're here for video number two. And so let's just uh, get right into what we want to, what I want to talk about today. So um, the title of this talk is "What Was So Radical About Zinzendorf: 18th Century Theological Innovation." And I wanted to sort of uh, on this 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 the second video. Our first video was a um, little bit introductory in nature. It talked about um, we talked about sort of setting up the series and setting up sort of the context for um, uh, for theology and the th theology and faith in the 21st century. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that one, definitely go back uh, and give that one um, give that one a watch. Um, and in this lesson, we're going to dive headfirst into Zinzendorf and really look at this in this talk and the next one. Really look at Zinzendorf's theology and what makes it unique. Uh, and what makes him a unique thinker, not just for today, but during his time as well. So, um, so let's just get into talking about um, about 18th century theology and what made Zinzendorf so radical. So, um, a little bit of context is important first to understand sort of uh, what <clears throat> what was going on in the time um, that Zinzendorf was writing and thinking, and um, and, and what was going on. Uh, in in the German church of that time. And so to give a little bit of context, um, the Lutheran church, which was the state church of Germany at that time, um, I think it would be, you could easily say that it was disconnected from the everyday life of a lot of people. Um, everyone was involved in a church that you, you were a member of, you, you know, you were part of a church sort of by social obligation, but Zinzendorf picked up on the, um, sort of this, this, some key disconnects and um, one of the movements at that time that was sort of trying to reform against um, the traditional sort of Orthodox Lutheran Church was the Pietist movements and we could spend a whole Comenius learning series talking about the Pietist movement but the thing that I want you to sort of know about Zinzendorf is that he was very much connected to the Pietist movement very much connected to Lutheran Orthodoxy but still didn't really fit into either one of those um, ideological camps fully. Um, obviously, there's all different kinds of pietists, um, but Zinzendorf really saw some issues with the main, the main branches of those. Even though he was very influenced and a lot of his ideas are very similar, <clears throat> Zinzendorf is really doing something unique um, at the time, um, theologically and even in his practices and hymns and writings and all of that kind of stuff. So what's going on at this time that's making things so uh, so challenging? So um, wh where's this disconnect coming from? Uh, the main thing that um, the main thing going on sort of intellectually at that time is Zinzendorf is right in the middle of the age of the Enlightenment. Um, this is also known as the age of reason. So this is the, the moment in, in human history where reason and the, and the five senses become the primary um, sources of knowledge. So no longer is knowledge something that um, solely is given from God or discovered from God, but knowledge and reason are something that are within um within human capacity. So our five senses, I can touch and feel, and we can know things by our five senses. And there's a lot of critiques of the Enlightenment, and those, those come not very long after the Enlightenment. Um, but it's important to know sort of how um, much of a new idea this was at the time of which Zinzendorf is sort of coming of age. Um, especially coming of age intellectually and beginning to think on his own. He was, um, Zizor was very impacted by these thinkers. He, he read a lot of them. Um, these would have been sort of the big issues of the day. And um, one, I wanted to share one quote with you. This is from um, Arthur Freeman's book, 
an ecumenical theology of the cross, which is an excellent text um, for sort of getting into Moravian theology or getting into Zinzendorf theology. And he, this is um, where he describes um, a little bit about the Enlightenment from page 38. Uh, and he says, in talking about the Enlightenment, he says that reason was no longer used to show the truth of the Christian faith, as has been done by St. Thomas Aquinas, but now challenged the basic tenets of religion itself and the methods by which religion approached knowledge of truth. So this is a, this is a really key thing to understand um, pretty early on when we're talking about Zinzendorf, which is that this, this, sort of sh this sort of shift in thinking that's happening in the, in the Enlightenment are, um, are, are pretty seismic. And you'll find that thinkers and theologians and philosophers and scientists and everyone sort of coming after the Enlightenment, all it, like it's, you, everything sort of um, branches out of this, this moment in history. And Zinsdorf sort of right smack dab in the middle of the whole thing. And for him, Zinsdorf's concerns are what does faith, religion, God, Christ, like how do how do these things that, he, that that so impacted him in his life and his um, he had a you know his personal life was very impacted particularly as a young um, a young child with these ideas what does it mean in the face of um, in the in the face of the age of reason in the face of where reason used to be the thing that we would use to prove God and now reason is becoming used to disprove God. And so, what is what does this mean for the future of uh, the future of faith, Christianity, all of those things? And it's important to know that that Zinzendorf isn't what makes him so so radical for his time. Is he does something that um, he does something that the other other thinkers don't do, which is um, which is go one way or the other. Because you have some thinkers in the realm of theology and religion. Who just sort of push through the Enlightenment and try to think through like we can we have to think through God and religion only using reason, which um, you know leads to things like belief in like a deism, which is just sort of like God maybe set everything in motion and then just sort of backed off like sort of the clockmaker idea of God, or um, or the other side is to just abandon the notion of reason altogether, that um, that, that 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 this thing this thing that we call reason um, is is either wrong or useless or doesn't have a purpose in finding truth. Um, so, which then leads to just sort of like a superstitional like superstitions and. Um, and really just abandons all of the discoveries of the Enlightenment. Um, but what Zinzendorf does is he wants to reconcile these ideas. So he is not, he doesn't want to dismiss reason altogether. He doesn't want to say that reason doesn't have a point. All you've got to do is, um, you know, just believe in God with your heart, and then you can leave your head out of it, that this heart and this head are two different things. And I know we call, like, Zinzendorf is often cited by call by um, d his theology is often often described as a heart theology, but um, it's important to remember that this this notion of heart in in his in the German language isn't like the seat of emotions like we think of it as today. Like it's just it's just emotionality or it's just what you feel. Like feeling and thinking are divided. For Zinzendorf, heart religion meant an ent an, an entirety of being. So it was all of who you are. Um, and so Zinzendorf's sort of innovation in theology in, in the 18th century was to not abandon the principles of the Enlightenment and not to abandon, abandon the notion of faith um, completely. So what he, he wants to sort of reconcile these two. And there's a lot of thinkers that come and do that afterwards, but Zinzendorf is one of the, one of the first to really engage at this philosophically and the theologically. And what's interesting, and this is what we're going to get into in our next conversation, is, is how he goes about that. Because he doesn't go about it by writing long theological text or by making sort of like very long reasoned, you know, sort of here's my 15-point 
you know, systematic philosophy or systematic theology on how I understand things. But Zinzendorf really sees the way to do this by putting things into practice. So um, it's a very practical theology in that sense, but it's not a faith absent of thinking or absent of reason, but one that really embraces reason, but finds a way to not let reason be um, the be all end all. It's not the, um, it is reason itself is not a God to be worshiped, but reason is not something to be abandoned either. And so what does it mean to hold these two things in tension? Um, Art Freeman in, in his book, uh, and calls this a, 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 a foundational paradox of Christian faith. <clears throat> um, and for Zinzendorf, the core of that paradox is Christ, the God become man, um, the God incarnate, the God on the cross. And that's what we're going to get into. That's what we're going to get into in our next conversation, um, which is going to be on specifically the wounds theology and why um, why this, um, why Zinzendorf's understanding of, of who Jesus was was so, so, so important. Um, and that is actually what makes him so radical. So the thing that, you know, what was so radical about Zinzendorf was that he didn't, he did not sort of go one side or the other in this enlightenment debate. He really did want to sort of um, hold these two things that should be contradictory, that should contradict each other, but hold them together in tension and paradox. Um, and he does that through the way he thinks about Christ, the way he thinks about Jesus, specifically his idea of the wounds of Christ and the wounded Jesus. So um, that's a little bit about, um, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about sort of what made Zinzendorf so radical why he was different in his time because i think that's really important to understand because i think in that hopefully you saw some of in, in this conversation or in this talk some of the ways in which we might be experiencing some of the same things so the the issues that that zinzendorf was approaching sort of philosophically intellectually with the enlightenment we can see some parallels you know we are dealing with with similar questions to how we how do we know things where you know what is what is truth, um, you know, um, especially in a world where it's like, I have my truth, you have your truth, we have um, alternative facts, um, you know, we have this world where we even the question of like, is what is true just what is true for me? Um, and so we have these, these, and these were the same sort of things that um, the, was going on in the Enlightenment, these questions around how do we know? How do we know things? Um, and subsequently, how do we know things about God? Um, and Zinzendorf is going to point us always back to we know things about God because of Christ, and Christ is always wounded. And we'll get into more of that um, in our next talk, but I wanted to sort of set the stage for how Zinzendorf was innovating his theology in the 18th century and how we might be able to pick up some threads um, from his innovation up to how we might innovate theology in the 21st century to address some of the same questions around how do we know things, particularly how do we know things about God. So thank you for joining me for um, this talk number two, and hope you will um, find hope you found it helpful, and hope you'll tune in for the next ones, and look forward to having a conversation together. Grace and peace, everybody.